This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Doc here for DetroitBeardCollective.com, Detroit's premier grooming company. Visit DetroitBeardCollective.com for quality beard care products. Detroit Beard Collective is a Michigan-based company that takes pride in providing quality and affordable products for men to care for their beards. Jock uses the beard soaps when his rec league hockey team is growing out their beards. If you're rocking a beard this winter, you definitely need to check out the Beard Butter Leave-In Conditioning Beard Balm. Beard Butter will make your beard feel softer, better smelling than ever before. Go visit DetroitBeardCollective.com and at checkout, use the promo code DSP for 15% off savings. That's DetroitBeardCollective.com, promo code DSP. I want to tell you about our newest sponsor, Team Top Cat Sales. Are you looking for team apparel for your high school, your club sports team, or corporation? Look no further than Top Cat Sales, located on the east side of Main Street in downtown Royal Oak, between 11 and 12 Mile. Through founder and former University of Michigan QB John Wangler's leadership, Top Cat Sales has developed a tradition of selling and distributing custom Adidas team apparel with the highest quality and best service. Get your organization, school, or club team all in with Adidas today by going to TopCatTeamSales.com. That's TopCatTeamSales.com. Also, follow TopCat on Twitter at Team TopCat. Hey, everybody. This is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listen to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. Welcome in, everybody. Thank you for downloading another episode on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. This is the Doc and Jock Sports Program, the signature program on our network. Been around since September 2013, and this episode is number 131. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me, Adam the Jock Strozinski. What's up, cuz? Whether it's a windstorm, a tornado, a snowstorm, any type of man-made, earth-made, God-made catastrophe, we're showing up and we're putting this thing out. Why? Because we cra- love it, man. We're crazy guys. Love talking Detroit sports. And we love the platform that we've created here. The opportunity to just fire up the mics, talk about the news and notes, the happenings, the great news with the Tigers, the unfortunate news with the Super Bowl, some great stuff with the Wings and Pistons ahead on this fine episode number 131. Good stuff, bro. What's been going on with you? And don't forget, we crown a picks champion. I wonder who that's going to be. We, Stay we tuned. We crown that this uh, this episode here. Oh, man. It's going to be good stuff. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. First and foremost, what did you end up doing for the Super Bowl? Where did you end up watching it? Uh, I went over to uh, my buddy Dave's house. Um, his sister was throwing a party. Um, my wife was a little bit underneath the weather the last couple days. So we were going to go to our other buddy's house, but he has small children. Thought it would be best not to expose her to them and make them even sicker. So we went to my buddy Dave's house where there's nothing but adults, and uh, debauchery ensued. It was a good time. Uh, He has a really nice TV, by the way, because that was one of the things on our checklist for the Super Bowl, and she put out a great spread, dude. I was sitting there mowing on chicken wings 30 minutes after the Super Bowl, so it was good. It was a good time. Where'd you watch? You watched it at home, right? Nope. I ended up going to, I got an invite from uh, my brother-in-law's brother, Mm -hmm. went over there with the kids. The kids had a wild time, had some subs, pizza, jets, and it was good, man. So we got there right on, like an hour before the game, watched a little bit of the pregame. I was kind of shocked. It was nice to see all the MVPs come out. It was uh, nice to see Lady Gaga do her thing. Settled in there till halftime. Halftime, that's a 20-minute drive, got home right in time for the kickoff, missed all that nonsense with the halftime show. People maybe didn't like it or whatever it was. It's not for me. I mean, I absolutely hate the halftime show. Yeah, not for me. I think they me. do an awful job with it now. Yeah, so that was a good time for me. Get back and enjoy the second half and enjoy the game all the way through. And we'll talk about the Super Bowl in our edition of the Doctors in Session later on. But to kick off this podcast this week, some news with the boys of summer. The Detroit Tigers, they got J.D. Martinez on a great deal, extended him for two more years in a deal that when you obviously look at it, it's win-win for both parties. I mean, JD gets a raise, but it's not so much that it it balloons the salary cap. He gets a two-year $18.75 million deal, and I believe it's, you know, 18 and a half to 18.75, I believe. 18 and a half. And he gets, but only 6.75, I believe, the first year, and it balloons up to over 11 in the second year. So it's a, it's a good chunk of money, and it keeps everything manageable. 
And I'm pretty satisfied on both fronts with what Alavila did. It's a good move. And one that you could say, well, he gets to free agency at age 30. So if he wants to break the bank, if he has two more productive years, if you look at it, you could say, well, he could have bro- broke the bank now and get the money now because there's no guarantee he's going to drop 30 more home runs in each of the next two years. So this is a little bit of a risk for JD, but great for the Tigers. I think this works out perfect for both parties. You got to look at it this way, right? JD was going to go to arbitration this year. He was probably going to pull in somewhere close to $9 million. If he has a really productive season or something in between what he's done the last two years, that $9 million, if he was going to hang out for another year, was probably going to go something close to twelve to fifteen. So the Tigers kind of get him on a cheap, all right? And it's really not on the cheap, but it is kind of on the cheap. If you look at the way this contract could have bloomed. And you're right, a lot of .75s in the in the yearly salary, but 18 and a half overall. Right. So it's a two-year deal. That's perfect for the Tigers because in two years, they can sit there and reevaluate their salary structure. Also, if JD continues on his trajectory up and he keeps producing the way he's producing, like you said, he can go kill the bank, get a monster contract. Hopefully, it's with the Tigers. And he can stay either a Tiger for life or he can go someplace else and make more money. So it works out really well for both parties. I think the most important part of this contract was getting it done before it ever went to arbitration, though. Because, like you said, the Tigers kind of saved themselves that first year. And that second year is much more palatable instead of it going to arbitration the next couple years. And on top of that, now you can put all your focus into getting ready for the season. With them having to go to arbitration, there would be all this kind of overhanging the heads, and you just have to kind of work your way through it, and it would be a lot of conversation of, oh, are they going to sign JD? Is JD going to come back? What's going to happen with JD? What's going on? What's this? What's that? Now you can avoid all of that. He's now locked up for two years. He can go to spring training. He can get practicing, get the show on the road, get everything ready, and hopefully we can win a World Series the next year or two. I thought that, wow, I'm like, you know what? This offseason – for Al Avila doesn't seem like one of someone that's new to the job. It seems like, okay, you know what? When you look at it, you know what? He really did learn under Dave Dombrowski. He really did take in a lot of um, information and was able to kind of parlay it into getting some really relatively good deals. You spent money on guys that you believe, you spent big money on guys you believe are going to be productive. So now we get a chance to evaluate his decisions. The part Do you th- think he's doing a better job now than Dave Dombrowski did, I don't know what, five, six, however long Dave Dombrowski was here? Because I think he's had a much more successful season this first year that he's been the general manager than Dave Dombrowski did. I just need to see probably a little bit, in his tenure. I just need to see a little bit more of what this is going to translate on the field. Because yes, on paper, it looks like Alavilla's done a great job adding pitching, adding uh, additions, key additions to the bullpen. You now locked up uh, J.D. Martinez, so it look and you got a couple of big name guys, Upton and um, uh, Zimmerman. So you got guys in here that are expected to produce on paper. But now, as a mix, I'd like to see what this looks like because the first key decision that he made was keeping Brad Ausmus. Now, that's going to be something that's going to be tied to Al Avila. But the part that I still that a lot of people talk about is still, I, I still believe he did Dave wrong. You went, He went to a party with Dave, picked him up, and you started looking at how it went down like, he knew the weekend before, so that means he's got a little bit of a cold-blooded a, nature. It was a little shady. It, it was, was. It was a little shady. It was. Remember we talked about mm-hmm. it, and we're like, dude, a little bit cold-blooded. Like, you went to a party that you're a guy that was your mentor for 24 years, and you don't kind of slip him a, hey, now, maybe I'm sick, I'm not going to go. That's a little bit of a cold-blooded, and that's something that you, while we look at it here and go, ooh, that's something you kind of need as a general manager in order to evaluate things. And I'm hoping that if you just took the words out of my mouth, I was going to say, isn't that something you want your you general manager need them to, to kind of be like that? And if, because if, if the season starts off a little bit twisted and the Tigers don't get off to that great start, then I'm hoping that he goes in there and brooms out Brad Ausmus and brings in someone that can help this team out. Because really in the end, we're all impatient. It's all nice now going up into spring training. Everyone's got the high of all the signings. The positivity train and the positivity PR is is really high right now, but it could turn real fast if the season doesn't start off the way it needs to. The Tigers have to start off good because, like I said, the payroll didn't stay the same. It went up. So that means a little bit more pressure on Vila, a little bit more pressure on Osmus, and a little bit more pressure on the organization as a whole. I think you're right on. Everything you said, I think you're right on. That being said, I think that Al Avila is counting on some guys to come back and kind of elevate their game a little bit. And the guy who I think he's really counting on, actually, I think there's two guys. I think it's going to be Nick Castellanos. I think he's going to count on him to 
maybe fill out a little bit more, possibly be a 15-20 home run guy, have something close to a 270 uh, batting average, and, and maybe sit there drive in 65 to 70 RBI. And I think he's counting on having Jose Iglesias come back and be that flashy stud at sec at shortstop. And I can see Jose Iglesias coming back, and I can see him being a really productive member to this team and really helping elevate, not just on the defensive side, but on the offensive side. you got to remember, he wasn't touted as a 300 career hitter, but every season that he's played for the Tigers, he's basically hit 300. He's been solid as a rock right there. And, you know, he doesn't have a ton of power. He basically is just kind of swat at the ball and get on base. That's it. That's all he does. But I think having those two guys elevate their game a little bit, come in, be solid, be steady, I think that helps fill out this lineup, especially that back order of the batting rotation. Now, with the Tigers, you said it yourself. A lot of players are going to have to be expected to do a little bit more than they did last year. Now, the question is, are they going to be consistent throughout that entire lineup? Like we said before, boom or bust, you got to have consistency really top to bottom because you're top heavy, potentially, and you could look at, okay, that bottom half of that lineup has to step things up because you can't have situations where V-Mart, Miggy, and uh, J.D. are all on base and you got the lower-end guys you got the lower end guys in, in that batting order not cleaning up and not getting those guys home. So it's going to be interesting to see with what the Tigers do, how the lineups shake out if things don't work out right away. We talked about a little bit what the lineup could look like, but I'm interested to see because, you know, sometimes early in the season, some guys come off struggle. Sometimes, you know, Nick Castellanos wants to do better, but what if he starts off the year and he's not good? What are the backup options? Well, I think that kind of feeds into your point where you said that they have to kind of start off hot. They have to start off well because the way that this uh, batting order is kind of set up, these guys do hit in waves. They'll sit there and they'll be hot and they'll be hitting the cover off the ball, blasting 450, 500, and the next thing you know, it'll dry up a little bit and they'll be scuffling along, hitting 200. In the end, you've got a 300 lineup, but... It's boom or it's bust. And that's just kind of the way that this batting order has been built over the course of, what, the last 10 years? So it, it's one of those things where I think you're absolutely right. They have to start off hot. It's going to help ensure that Brad Ausmus keeps his job, keeps some continuity in that dugout and in that locker room. But it's also going to help protect and insulate this team when they do struggle because there will be those lulls in the season where they go on a five- or six-game tear where – they're not getting anybody across the plate. And then we're all sitting here talking about these monster contracts and how this payroll is so inflated, and yet these guys are scratching out one or two run games. Let's speculate a little bit, and let's see. Let's get our little forecast here. Okay. Because both deals for your big bats, Justin Upton and J.D. Martinez, both of them are committed for the next two years. So what that means is both of them are going to be here, and they're going to be hopefully a very productive unit on offense. But do you think... In two years, both guys are still here playing for the Tigers? Or without success, do you say, you know what, let's unload, and these are two pieces that if there's a struggle, if there's a situation where things get twisted and they bottom out, because while everyone would like success, you also got to sometimes say, well, if it doesn't work out, you blow this thing up, and the easiest way to do it is unload those guys. Two years' time, they still with the Tigers? Can I be ballsy and make a prediction? I think those two guys in particular will have the best years of their career the next two seasons. That makes it even worse because then you got to pay each of them, what, 20, 25 million? You can't do that. You're right. You can't. But that's if you got to remember, Justin Upton signed for the next seven years. He might get really comfortable hitting where he's hitting and, and where he's at in that batting lineup, as well as where he's playing at, where he doesn't want to sit there and adjust. But if he has two great years, he's going to opt out, guaranteed. But he can only opt out after the second year. Right. So if he has a if he has a solid year next year, maybe it's not his career highlight. Maybe it's just a really solid year. But he comes back that second year, and he's through the roof. He's locked in now. So now you've got him for what? Was it a seven-year contract? Is that what that was? So now you're stuck with him. Now, J.D. Martinez, on the other hand, after two years, you're right. He could go away. And if he does go away, I think that would suck because – you got to remember, the Tigers were the ones that kind of dug him out of the bushel bin, brought him here, dusted him off, worked on his batting swing, and basically got him squared away to where now we're talking about this guy possibly being the guy who kind of takes over. And look, nobody's going to do what Miguel Cabrera does, all right? Miguel Cabrera is a special talent. Nobody's going to do that. But J.D. Martinez has the potential to sit there that if something catastrophic happens to Miguel Cabrera, J.D. Martinez can kind of fill in and slot in and help alleviate some of that pressure, especially with his bat. 
And on top of that, he plays a really solid defensive game out there in right field. He's good. You know, I mean, he's not, I don't think he's gold glove winning by any stretch of the imagination, but he's not a liability out there. I think he's solid. I think he's a plus defender. So I think that over the course of the next two years, these guys will have career years. That can only bode well for the Tigers' success because, yeah, you're going to be counting on these two guys as well as healthy Miguel Cabrera and a healthy Victor Martinez. So a lot of guys last year in the 2015 year kind of had some down years, nothing really too spectacular. You had some up-and-coming guys that you're going to want to look for in 2016, like McCann, like Iglesias, and you want to see what their growth is going to be like. But in terms of the big guys, JV, Miguel Cabrera, Victor Martinez, who, you know, each of them had, you know, their own unique seasons, and they're all going to try to want to come back this year and do a much better job. Or anybody else, who do you think this year in 2016 is going to produce so well and have that comeback year that you'll say, you know what, who's the Tigers' comeback player of the year? I think it has to be JV. I think for this team to have some success, you're counting on JV being that JV of old. Possibly not where he's a Cy Young winner, but you're looking at him to help win you anywhere from 17 to 20 games. If things are on the skids, he's going to come in. He's going to be your stopper. He's going to help get things right. So I think you're counting on JV to be much more productive this year than he was last year. Okay, now, see, I disagree a little bit. In that, I don't think he's going to be that productive in terms of actually getting to 15 to 18 wins. I see a little bit of a dip in his velocity. I don't know. I want to wait and see until spring training to see what that velocity looks like. What is he featuring? I know you could say, well, you can't judge a whole lot by what you see in spring training. They're holding back. But it will kind of show some indications as to kind of how he's maneuvering his pitches, what his moxie is, what kind of things he's going to try to feature. But Rem- I th- Remember this real quick. Remember this. I will counter you on this. All right. He started the year off really slow last year, missed a little bit of time. When he came back, it looked like he was 100% from that core muscle surgery. And he looked like he was much more comfortable when he was up there pitching. And once he kind of got on that little bit of a roll down the stretch of the season, he looked like a much better pitcher. And he looked a lot better than where he was earlier in the year and where he was the year prior to that. So I think he's going to come in. I think he'll be 100% healthy. I don't think he was 100% healthy last year. And I think that's going to be the big difference with him. And I think that's where you're going to see maybe a little bit of that velocity go up. But I also think he's working on developing some more pitches. We've talked about it before. JV is usually a thrower, gets up there, and he likes to throw it hard, sit there and try to dial it up to 104 if he could do it. I don't think he has that in his arsenal anymore. I think every now and then he'll be able to touch high 90s. I think now he's working with what he has. He can sit there and throw a fastball somewhere near 97, which is still really fast, but it's not what he used to do, and it's not what he's used to having. So I think he's now leaning more on his his slider, on his curveball, mixing his pitches, Throwing a change up, I think he's leaning more on those pitches than just his fastball. Whereas before, it was fastball, fastball, fastball. Let me throw a change up in there, and let me maybe mix a curveball in here because you're a left-handed bat. And that's kind of what you got with him. Okay, yeah, you're going by what you saw at the end of the 2015 season. I can respect that greatly. But I just have this vision of Roy Holiday out there trying to do his best, trying to come back. And each and every year, it'd be like, Roy Holiday's going to make that comeback. He's got that stuff. He's going to make that comeback. And each and every year, everyone was I like, I hope it's not like that. No, we're hoping I'm, not. Have, I'm having visions of Roy Holiday and like his last three seasons. Yeah. Oh, it was and, bad. Yeah. And I'm having visions of, okay, JV, you know, are there any advanced pharmaceuticals you might be looking into? And maybe you can go down that Roger Clemens track where you can kind of maybe increase your velocity in the next couple of years. Hey, man, um, I'd be willing to uh, put that aside. And uh, wink, wink, understand that if you're, uh, you know, going overseas or, you know, maybe email Peyton Manning and see if you can send some things over to Kate Upton's house, maybe that could work out for you. You know, use that kind of strategy. Use some connections. You just said a whole lot. (laughs) You know what? Listen, athletes copy each other. So if Peyton Manning allegedly got something shipped to his wife's department, maybe JV can get something shipped to his significant other's department. I think Kate Upton could do some... Kate Upton needs some HGH, in my opinion. Is that what you're saying? I think she You're needs, just coming out and saying it now, huh? Kate Upton needs some HGH. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And so we're all hoping, though. I would, you know, in all seriousness, we hope JV comes back. But the more realistic... I think option of someone that's going to be productive if they stay healthy is Victor Martinez. If he stays healthy, he's a career 300 hitter and a guy that knows how to hit the baseball consistently is a professional hitter. And a guy that if he's in this lineup, 
and he stays healthy. If he'd somehow, you know, if this is the year he doesn't hurt himself in offseason workouts because he's kind of doing that every other year thing where every other year he kind of tweaks something in his offseason program. So if this is the year he stays good, then I believe he's going to hit over 300 with at least 20 bombs and he's going to help that lineup significantly. A guy like Victor Martinez got that big contract. Most of us weren't thinking that in years three and four he was going to be doing a lot of things. So this is going to be the year that maybe you max him out and see what he can do before the downside of his his career happens because obviously as he gets older, the bat speed's going to get lower. He's not going to be able to have that much more productivity. So I'm hoping that this is the year he comes back, stays healthy, and is a productive member. So in my opinion, Victor Martinez is the guy I think gonna, that could be the comeback player of the year for the Tigers. And if he does, if he's a productive member along with Miguel Cabrera, because you know if Miguel's healthy, he's going to do his thing, at least 25 home runs, driving a lot of runs, a lot of contact. He'll be he'll be a, a key member. But Victor is, is another significant cog. Man, that lineup, again, when you look at that lineup, Martinez, Miguel Cabrera, Justin Upton, J.D. Martinez. Whew. And you know what? I don't want to face that. What you said right there. Victor Martinez is such a difference maker, especially offensively. He really helps to protect Miguel Cabrera. On top of that, he helps that he there's like a trickle down effect with him batting when he's on because it helps boost up JD Martinez and it helps boost up Nick Castellanos and it helps get more runs in. You're absolutely right. Everything you said is spot on. And he is just a monster difference maker on the offensive side of the ball. And if he could come back and he is healthy, and you're right, if he does hit 300, great things for the Tigers. Yes, sir. So just in general now, pitchers and catchers are going to report very soon. I think uh, next Thursday it's going down. So eight days away from spring training action, the Tigers are going to be playing some games. Now I think February 29th they open up uh, this, the exhibition season, and it's going to be a fun time. It's going to be one that a lot of people are going to peek into for the month of March and just come out of Florida healthy, and everything should shake out okay because now the big question mark is is Brad Ausmus going to survive this year and is he going to be one that and I asked Vito that too if you were to lay odds who do you think will survive 2016 and keep their job Jim Caldwell or Brad Ausmus because both of them their seats are on fire both of them got new general managers a lot of turnover in management right now in Detroit when you look at it now is Alavila going to be the X man so you got actually uh two questions who fires their manager first the Lions or the Tigers? Who 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 gets the hatchet? Who does that? Who does the job? I'm gonna say because we're counting on Calvin Johnson retiring, and I think that there are much more holes on that Detroit Lions team. So I think it's probably gonna be Caldwell, and I think he'll probably be gone sometime right around week eight or nine next season. Okay, so that means you that means you would expect Brad Ausmus to survive this season. Mm. I think Al Avila is a hatchet man, you know, just like the gentleman that came for the one-on-one podcast on our network. I think Al Avila might get that nickname because by the All-Star game, if this team isn't purring right and they're not playing good, if they're st- if they're playing around 500, I think he's not going to hesitate to pull that trigger because a lot of people are whispering that Brad Osmus was fired and that once that report came out, that the organization was like, oh, we can't do it like this, that they actually changed their mind and that he was fired because... A lot of people had that report, so it, was, it wasn't coming from thin air, and a lot of people are saying, well, if you want to speculate, then maybe Brad was fired, but then it, was, it wasn't like kept top secret, and then when they found out, they're like, oh, shit, we, 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 our secrets were let out. We can't do that anymore. Let's just ride with it and you know, bite the bullet. If that happened, that's even weaker, man. If you're going to fire him, who cares how it gets found out? You know, I, I know, you know out there in the NBA, you know, George Carl's hanging on a string, and he's getting fired every day. <laughs> you know, you, that's dude, the, he was gone. Now he's back. <laughs> now he he's was gone. gone. Now he's back, dude. It's like a yo-yo. So that's the same thing that's happened with the, the Tigers and Lions. I just kind of want a little bit more decisive nifts, but with success, we'll see these guys keep their jobs. So I might go on a limb and say they both keep their jobs beyond 2016. I want them both gone. I think that they'll both keep their jobs with some modicum of success. Mm. We shall see. All right, good stuff. Love talking baseball. Dude, that was, Tiger season's right around the corner. Right around the corner. Let's take a quick time out. We'll come back, play a round of the doctors in session, and then after that, we'll peek in on the Red Wings and the Pistons. Stay with us. Detroit Sports Podcast Network, Doc and Jock, episode 131. Doc and Jock here for Fanatic U. If you're looking for some sweet sports swag and you love your Detroit teams, and I mean you really love your Detroit teams, you got to check out FanaticU.com. Check out FanaticU.com. Use Promo code DSP, save 15%, even off the clearance items, and get the coolest gear out there and rock your Red Wing shirt, rock your Lions shirt, rock your Piston apparel. Wear it till the wheels fall off. Michigan, Michigan State, you know what? They got it too. 
Check out Fanatic U. They have six locations all over Metro Detroit. Check them out, fanaticu.com. Yeah, we coming now. Come on. Oh, uh, yeah. That's right. We put it down. It's like a family in here, just a little disabled. Putting it down, we lay them out on the table. Yeah. Who's in the house? The brothers in the house. Gotta turn it on out, but you know what we about. Kinda like Cain and Abel. A big, unstable, don't be breaking the brain. Thank you for staying with us, enjoying this fine podcast on our network. Thank you for finding it across our various platforms, whether it be Podomatic, Stitcher, the DetroitSportsNation.com website, anywhere at all you can find this fine podcast, whether it be on iTunes. Um, Check us out. Thank you for your continued support. We love doing this each and every week now. Going strong since September 2013, and only bigger and better things happening across the board. All right, sir, it's that time of the show where we play The Doctor is in Session. But to be the man, you got to beat the man. And I'm saying, woo, right here, I'm the man. Woo! All right, man, are you ready for a loaded Doctors in Session All Super Bowl edition? Yes, sir. I'm ready to hear what you got. What do you got for me? All right, what are your thoughts on how the Super Bowl played out? Let me tell you this. I, you know, I texted you during the game, and I'm like, okay, right after the game ended, I'm like, you know, stud or dud kind of a game. Me personally... I love defensive effort, and it got me even to change my whole thesis regarding the Lions organization. I want them to build like Denver, build through the defense. It kind of mirrors what they did. John Elway blew out John Fox, got a guy that he trusted, his guy, a guy that was his teammate, and he used the last couple drafts to draft Von Miller to kind of readdress that defense, to bring in, you know, uh, Peyton Manning to that squad, an aging veteran. So Denver... All kudos to John Elway for recognizing, hey, this is what I need to kind of take my team now to the next level. Because remember, John Fox was blown out, and everyone was like, he had some playoff success. He got them to the Super Bowl. Nope, John Elway's like, I I see something different here. I see potential with this squad. If I just tweak these certain areas, you know, that draft with with, uh, Cam Newton, I believe it was Cam Newton, Von Miller, 1-2. And who was the MVP of the Super Bowl? Von Miller on defense. So, for me personally, I love the defensive effort. I thought it was kind of a tough grind because it was exclusively a defensive effort. You could say, come on now, Denver and Carolina's offense, not a lot shown there. So for outside people that were watching, I can understand why you said, oh, it's boring and things like that. But it ended up still being number two most watched NFL football game of all time with a huge rating. And that's because it's the Super Bowl. There's a lot more things with it, with the commercials, which I think you love. Uh, the halftime show. Can't stand the commercials. Which I know you love as well. <laughs> I'm sure you were all like, ooh, I like that outfit by Beyonce. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping she fell off the platform. The game could have been better. And when you compare it to what we saw last year, it wasn't as good. But I love defense. I love watching defensive teams go at it because what did Denver do? They knuckled down and they hit Cam Newton square in the mouth. They rattled him. He came out there looking like he didn't know how to throw a football, which is what I thought would happen. I thought that, and I was waiting for the, um, because if you heard last week's podcast, I picked Denver with the points, but thought Carolina might come out with the victory. But then I saw the tweet and it came out, changed my entire thinking. That's why I tweeted out before I thought it was going to be Denver in overtime. They said that Peyton Manning delivered an emotional speech in that locker room. So I thought that was a retirement speech. I read that. I'm like, okay, good. He did it. Denver's winning it. No doubt about it. Once I saw that tweet, I knew it right away. You're such a flipping flopper. No, no. I had Denver in the point. That's all you need. I didn't think, and I said. This Super Bowl was a complete dud. You're no. Right, you're right. You're right. Good. Defense, it, I love watching defense as much as the next guy. All right, but this this Super Bowl sucked ass. It was <laughs> atrocious. It was boring. There were times there where I've said it probably three times watching the game. I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe as horrible as Carolina is playing this game, they are still in it. That's how bad this game was. Carolina played like absolute dog doo doo because of Denver's defense. And yes, and they were still in the game though. Mind blowing. All the way up until three minutes left in the game, Carolina still had a shot. Let's move on. It was an atrocious Super Bowl. I totally disagree with you. What are your thoughts on the way Cam Newton handled the media after the Super Bowl? He's been getting killed everywhere because of walking out after basically answering questions for two and a half minutes. More and more, the story came out that he was overhearing Chris Harris Jr. blasting him and saying that they didn't, that Denver didn't believe that Cam Newton could throw to win the game. So he's pissed. I mean, it's a terrible setup by the NFL. It was atrocious. It's, it's not a good setup. And I don't like the camera angle, too. You got the camera low looking at a guy. Kind of, it, wasn't product, it wasn't produced well. It didn't look right. 
I hate that view altogether. But I don't blame Cam Newton. I don't blame him at all. I mean, you just lost something that you wanted. And I agree with what he did two days later. I mean, on Tuesday, he comes out after a couple of days to cool down. He's like, show me a good loser, and I'm going to show you a loser. I'm, And he said, I've come out, and I've already talked to you guys. I told you, I'm not a good loser. Now, the uh, the people's opinions that are bashing him are saying, hey, if you're going to sit there and dance and, and do your thing, then you got to sit up there and take the take the medicine when you lose, which I can agree. And I, and I also agree when you, when you use the label professional athlete, that's your job as a professional athlete is to answer the questions. But the other side of the story, to make it complete, these teams tell these guys the media hates you, the media is out to get you, watch what you say. Couple that with the extreme emotion that you saw in that game and the fact that they didn't play well, that he got rocked that game. I don't blame him one bit. I wouldn't have, I would have actually, what I would have did was get my checkbook, how much it's going to cost if I don't go out there. Just, and then if the fine's two grand, I'll make it four. Sorry, I was just heated. You know, sorry, I don't care about your deadline. I was just so pissed off. I'll pay double the fine, take it to charity. And then two days later, you go out and say what you say. I have no problem with what he did. Should he, should he have pulled a Marshawn Lynch? I'm just here so I won't get fined. No, he's not like that. He's a guy He's a guy that's emotional, and the reason why he's celebrating is because he's an emotional guy. I'm not surprised. I mean, if you got a guy dancing, doing his thing, you think he's just going to come up there and just be contrite afterwards? No, it's based on emotion. He was pissed, and, you know, in a couple of years, people will say, yeah, he'll grow up, and he'll come out of it. He won't act like that. But as of now, a 26-year-old kid who just lost the Super Bowl, I would be the same way. I, I wouldn't even – I would have had a couple more curse words. I just would have been like, man, we totally fucked this up. It, it, it's a terrible situation, and da da da, da and that would have been bleep galore. And uh, that's – because it, it's an emotional game. And when people say he should have acted like this, I, I can't go with that. I agree with what he did 100%. And uh, with that, if you want to dog him, though, he, everyone has the right to dog him. But I agree with what he did. All right. I don't really have a problem with what he did either. I'm an emotional guy. He handled it probably a lot better than I would have handled it. That being said, what do you see the class of the NFL, Peyton Manning, doing next? Well, I mean, I was totally shocked after the game when he's like, you know what? I talked to Tony Dungy, and it, you know, he told me not to retire here and take away from the success of the team, not to take away from MVP Von Miller. And he just does things so you know, calculated and so professional that he's going to take time, and he's actually going to. Take a month or two, celebrate, drink as much Budweiser as he wants. You know, he's going to have a good old time celebrating this victory, which, by the way, is the best way to go out where you really didn't have to do nothing. He got, what, like a 12 quarterback rating in that neighborhood? He did jack shit. He didn't do nothing. He basically was like, I'm going to show up. point that it was an atrocious football he game. He showed up, <laughs> kind of threw the ball a couple times, 12 yards, and kind of, you know, didn't turn it over too many times. You know, he didn't kill the team, but he rode that defense to a victory. Do you he, think Gary Kubiak said to him, was like, Peyton, look, we've got a great defense. They're going to win you this game. No All doubt. All you have to do is not turn the ball over more than five times. That's it. Can you handle that? And Peyton was like, yeah, I should be able to. Yeah, Can we no. just do a lot of handoffs? <laughs> I mean, even if he would have been required to. I mean, uh, Carolina was like trying their best to absolutely lose that game with all the mistakes they were making. It's true. Every time they had a chance to gain some momentum, they'd get a penalty. I mean, Aqib Tlaib for Denver was getting penalties too. He was he was wilding out, doing his own thing, and they couldn't capitalize. I was just totally shocked that Carolina didn't put forth a little bit more effort. And in the end, Denver, like I said, they sent him out as he should have been sent out. He should he should he should retire. He should come out and say, okay, I'm going to do this. And there's talks he might go in the front office of Tennessee. He might take a TV job. But no matter what, he's a well-respected dude. Go out on top. You're 39 years old. You got nothing left to prove. Storybook, he's done. And I believe in, in the coming weeks you'll hear that Peyton Manning will no longer be in the NFL. And he'll he'll have a great legacy, two Super Bowls. He'll have uh, really put a stamp on what quarterbacks should do in the NFL. He'll have his respect, and he'll walk away as a most respected, one of the most respected quarterbacks of all time. For sure. Jump on uh, your love child, Papa John's shoulders, get carried out holding a pizza pie in your one hand and a Budweiser in the other, and roll off into the sunset. Now, just foreshadowing, thinking ahead, two, three years down the line, Bob Quinn still uh, struggling maybe, potentially. You uh, maybe put a call out feeler to Peyton Manning, come no. run this team? No, the guy can hardly move. He's, he's like a giant robot right now. Doesn't the formula kind of look he's, like what John Elway did? No. Maybe you, you don't. No. It, so I'm like, saying, I'm asking you, do you think Peyton Manning would be a successful front office dude in the NFL? Oh, well, 
I have to, I guess I should probably let you finish your question before I start bashing you, huh? Um, you know what? I think he's a really knowledgeable guy, and I think he's a student of the game. So, yes, I do think he would be a very good front office personnel man. But not with the Lions. The Lions need, like, miraculous talent. They need Jesus to come down and save them. Like, see, you know what happens? That negative fog just always comes over me with the Lions. Like, I'm so high on Bob Quinn right now, but part of me just feels like, you know what? Maybe he won't work out. Maybe he'll suck. You know, what if he's like, like how long are they going to stick with him if he Can doesn't I do it? Can I tell you something that I read, mm, like, you? a few weeks ago? There was an, like, there, this is while, like, all the Super Bowl media was kind of going on. So it was that two-week dead period where writers are just looking for things to put out. Dave Burkett interviewed a couple different front office personnel people. Uh-oh, uh-oh. And he asked them what their thoughts were on Bob Quinn. Some of them were like, who's Bob Quinn? They never <laughs> even heard of the guy. Oh, boy. And that just goes to show the Patriots don't let anybody that they believe is really good go away. Mm. So that being said, I'm nervous about Bob Quinn now. All now of a you're sudden, nervous? All of a sudden, yes. No, I, was, I didn't want him before. See, that's the story. What a Trent Kirchner. See, that's the history. Let's see what he does with this draft because maybe – maybe he's smarter than all of us and will focus on the defense. I do like some of the front office moves he's done. I do like some of the front office moves he's done thus far. And it's been a very short period that Bob Quinn's been on the job and we don't have a whole lot to really look at. So his limited moves, I am giving a thumbs up to so far. You know what will tell me that he's a bitch? What's that? If the Lions draft a wide receiver in the first oh round, I will know that's not his pick. I will he can't, scream. Yeah, he can't look at that landscape at that team and say, that's what we need in the first round. Go out there Dude, and build the happens. defense. No, no, if, if, if that happens, I know some. You know, I would say that if they pick a wide receiver in that first round, then you know they're looking to sell tickets and they're going for entertainment. Dude, if not that happens, happen. we're doing an hour-long podcast Bitch about fest. the Lions. Yes, and it's just murdering them for an entire hour. I mean— Treadwell is not a guy that you think he, I mean, he's not going to fall, and there's no one really else that you can, uh, you could go out and get Aaron Burbridge in the third round potentially, or trade up and get a wide receiver in a lower round. In the first round, defense or offensive lineman, period. That's Anything it. else? That's it. We're, it's going to be a not nice podcast from That's Doc it. and Jock. So, yeah, we, we, see, we think alike. Yeah, we do. I think alike. We, we, we see building a team together. Pretty Defense, much the same. Yeah. offensive line. That's it. I, I mean, and the rest of the pieces, you could just kind of sprinkle them in. Just do half, the, do half the work. Who's good on defense? Who's good on the offensive line? They get graded A+. plus. Everyone else, we don't care. We need the defense and the offensive line. Build like Denver. Don't build like Carolina. They'll have success, but if you have the number one defense, you got to remember the last, what, 10 of 12 number one defenses have won. And there's some weird number, too, that uh, a lot of teams that have wore the white jerseys have won the, the last wave of Super Bowls, which is kind of weird, but I just saw that on a tweet. I think it was ESPN Stats and Info. But number one defense is always win. I told I told everybody why is number one def- why is defense always wins championships stuck in my brain because a great defense will what they knock Cam Newton down f- forced a fumble got a touchdown they got points your defense cause can score points that's right and number one defenses and you see and they play your like offense that. can't stop other offenses but your defense can score you points defense can score you points that's right oh, on oh baby all right king of the couch hey great job you beat the man because you are the man yes sir bring so it strong great docs in session. Yes, sir. Let's take a quick break and jump into some uh, some Pistones and some Red Wings. How about that? Yes, look at that. Nice night in Detroit. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to uh, you know reminisce a little bit about a former MVP that was um, the MVP of the 2004 NBA Finals. Stay with us. Pistons Red Wings Talk next. Doc and Jock, Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I want to tell everyone out there about DetroitSportsNation.com. They're a great website, and they've been very supportive to all the shows on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. They host all the podcasts. They have great writers that cover all the Detroit teams, all the college teams. Check out their website and support those who support us. DetroitSportsNation.com. The collaboration has been excellent, and it's helped us to continue to grow and have great guests take phone calls. So our collaboration with the Detroit Sports Nation has really been successful, and support those who support us. DetroitSportsNation.com. All right, sir. Another great podcast, man. These things fly by. We just start recording, and, uh, you know, I had a chance to— let me tell you a little, little story before we start talking Pistons and uh, Pistons and Red Wings. I had a chance to go check out Podcast Detroit, the Theo Gridiron Podcast. Mm-hmm. It's a very, you know, nice place down there in Ferndale. It's um, it's uh, above Activate Gaming, I believe, and it's upstairs, and you go through. It's a nice studio feel. they got a nice green room area. You could have a couple beers and relax. The funny part was me and Theo, uh, when we met up, there was another show recording beforehand. 
And the the studio is interesting in that they just kind of roll through shows after shows. And these guys, this this group of like four or five people were talking about like dating and Tinder and stuff like that. And it was utterly hilarious. The stuff that people will do, you know, to try to find that significant other. Just real fast. Did you ever do online dating? No. Would you, now, if you were single, would you do Tinder? It, here's the thing, right? I have a buddy. His name's Matt. Matt, how you doing, buddy? I told you I shot you out on one of these, though. So. My buddy Matt Stoyanoff. I mean, put his whole name out there. He's the Tinder king. <laughs> Tinder king. <laughs> Matt. The, the, the dude swipes right on everything. Almost swiped right on a tranny. So we give him a little bit of grief for that. You know what I'm saying? Did he ever get a match yet? Um, He's met a couple girls off Tinder. And um, basically, Tinder is just there for hooking up. So he swipes right, meet up, hook up. And I don't know. I mean, he does whatever he does. I mean, he's a good looking dude. Does his own thing. So, you know, here's the thing. I've talked about this with a couple of my other buddies who aren't single anymore and the thing that we've all established if we had tinder when we were single we would all have numerous stds right now <laughs> because yes i would take advantage full advantage of tinder i would swipe right on just about everything that trolled my way oh no that's right i would take it all down i'd be like the huntsman just sitting there taking down my prey see i think man these these dating sites, they just capitalize on people's vulnerabilities. And you got Match.com, eHarmony. Now you got Tinder. You know, I know our boy Vinny loves Grinder. So <laughs> he does love Grinder. So all these sites that pop up, you know, Grinder is right. <laughs> he reminds me every week. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we. <laughs> so he reminds me every week. So, you know, I was gonna get back at him, and I found the right time. <laughs> Oh, I'm crying. <laughs> you want to be a little bit mean? You want to make him a fake profile on Grinder? And oh, we should. We should. We should. should. Should we do it? We could. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's let's work on that. I think we should and see if he gets any calls or swipes or love because he's got a nice pic couple of nice pictures of him flexing on our platform. <laughs> he usually looks like uh um the the Oompa Loompas from the um. From yeah, Willy Wonka because his skin's I, always orange. I think we're going to make a quick poll here and see what we can do. Should we make Vinny a grinder profile? We should make Vinny a grinder uh, profile. Right. You get my vote. See how we just go. We go. <laughs> all right. My man, um, when this comes out, the Pistons, when this comes out, the Pistons would have had a great night celebrating one of their own, a guy that, you know, really was a catalyst for that 2004 championship team. The Detroit Pistons re have retired Chauncey Billups' number now, along with Ben Wallace. And it's a great situation for the Pistons, a chance for them to truly honor a guy that, when he came here, was a guy that was really considered a cast-off and was somebody that was not respected. He was highly touted. I think he was a number three draft pick in the NBA by the Celtics, and he just bounced around. And Larry Brown found a guy that he could mold to be a really professional point guard got the nickname Mr. Big Shot, and what a special honor that he got to really call Detroit home and find a niche here in Detroit. You know what his big issue was when he came out of college? His big issue was he was essentially a point guard. He was drafted as a point guard, but really and truly he was a shooting guard. And you're right, when he came to Detroit, Larry Brown found somebody that he could mold, that he could shape, and turned him into the next big point guard, the next great thing. And that's what you got out of Chauncey Billups. He became a pass first, a distributing guy, a guy who would create other people's shots because he could get his own shot any time of the week. That's why he was referred to as Mr. Big Shot. That all being said, delve into your memory bank. What was your most favorite memory of Mr. Big Shot? Okay. Now, when you asked this question, I was like, oh, very good. He had a lot of great memories. Obviously, the half-court shot in the playoffs, all the big shots. But my favorite memory was something that happened off the court. When you remember in 2004, they won the title. People were like, oh, because that year in 2004 was a sensational moment for the Pistons organization. Joe D with the number two pick had selected, guess who? Not Carmelo Anthony, not Dwayne Wade, not anybody that's still playing in the league. He drafted Carmelo, or he drafted Darko Milicic. The human victory cigar. Exactly. So now the Pistons uh, that year... Uh, have Darko Milicic with a limited role. He's on the team, but he's not doing a whole heck of a lot. So they win the title, and it was a great season. They they really surprised everybody by beating the Lakers in five games, the five-game sweep. They took down Shaq and Kobe in their prime. You know, something that still to this day is a source of pride Carl for Detroit. and Gary Payton, too. A, a, they, were, they were more role players at this point in their career, but... A team that was assembled to win it all. Exactly. Now, the Pistons were heavy underdogs, and they were really... Flat, flat out disrespected by everybody. Nobody thought that the Pistons were were going to win that series, and that's why I think that that poster there that says respect is something that they earned. 
because they went out there and they punched the Lakers in the mouth. So now they win the title, they have the victory, the the victory celebration, the parade, and they go to the palace and they get to everybody. And he gets up there, grabs the mic, and he's like, Carmelo, who? <laughs> and he's like, Darko, what? So he addressed it at the celebratory thing. And it turns out you should have said Carmelo Anthony because he would have been on your team. You would have had more success. When you talk about the Pistons run, yeah, you they got the 2004 title, but a lot of haters are going to say, hey, now, you could have had a dynasty like the San Antonio Spurs. You could have. You, there was a lot of what could have been. But my favorite moment was his braggadociousness, his ability to come out there, address the elephant in the room, and he was like, Carmelo who? And it was like, you know, something that really was a stamp, you know, of the of the uh, 2004 team was like, hey, we're a bunch of castoffs. We're a bunch of we're a bunch of players that were put together because nobody really believed in us. And Larry Brown took that team, a team that he says is really one of the teams that gelled together and was able to do a lot of great things because there really was no superstar. It was a collection of talent that played great as a team. And so his comment there at was a great memory that I always remember. Mine had to been that 2004 season when Chauncey Billups hit that monster half court shot over the New Jersey Nets. And at that moment, it helped pro- propel them into the playoffs and I think really gave that entire team a boost of confidence and they started to believe that, hey, we can win this entire thing. And that got them into the series against the, uh, um, the Pacers and pretty much it was, it, was, it was written after that. You know what I'm saying? It was, there was not much left to be told. So my moment was him getting the ball with very few seconds left on the clock, comes up the floor, gets to half court, and next thing you know, it's just a dagger, just a dagger. And I think that shot helped propel that into an overtime. And from there, the the Pistons ended up, uh, I believe, going on to win the series. Now, everything's all nice and rosy with the Pistons. Sometimes they try to do some good PR, but something that you got to talk about is why on earth did Joe Dumars feel the need to deconstruct the team by trading Chauncey? By doing that, you really upset the the city. You really upset the fan base, and you can make the argument that potentially that they haven't come back because of it. So the trade of Chauncey Billups for, and I believe, am I right? Chauncey Billups for no, Allen Iverson? I'm, I'm looking, I'm actually, I'm on Wikipedia right now, and I was wrong when Chauncey hit that big three pointer from mm-hmm. midcourt. It didn't propel it into an overtime, and it might not even have been in the 2004 season. I just, whenever you say Chauncey Billups, yeah, did, did, that's yeah. my memory is him crossing half court and launching that from the uh, from the far side uh, of the court and it goes no worries. Don't let facts get in the way of a great story. No right, problems. No worries. Right, right. Uh, we all know when you say half court shot, it's all good, man. You know Don't what worry. I'm talking about. We know what you're talking about. But that deconstruct uh, Joe Dumars, really, I believe that process, you could have maybe squeezed, you know, another run. And I know a lot of people who argue that, you know, you got to evolve the team and you don't want to have situations where you keep the group together too long. I just felt like you could have rode Chauncey and, you know, brought up a, a young cat instead of trading him off because that was kind of a surprise. Yeah, the moment that they traded away Chauncey Billups, everything crumbled. You know, you lost your leadership, you lost your voice in the locker room, and those players started to act out and started to do things that were really inappropriate and that you didn't like to see of your Detroit Pistons team. You got to remember, Chauncey Billups kind of kept everything in-house, kept everything under wraps, kept everything in control. The moment he gets shipped out, they bring in Allen Iverson. Next thing you know, you've got players staging walkouts on coaches. You got Rip Hamilton piping off in the media. You have different guys doing different things that they normally wouldn't do if Chauncey Billups was here. And that was a major issue. That showed you how much control he had over that locker room and what he meant to that team. Yeah, no, I just I just thought that it was so dev- devastating because the guy that you brought in here, Allen Iverson, you know, he was spotted at so many casinos. Like the complete antithesis, uh, a- antithesis exactly. of, of, of what Chauncey was. You had the the prototypical ideal leader, and then you had, granted, Allen Iverson was my favorite player in the NBA, but you had basically a complete nutcase, a guy who was out there for himself, was me over team all the time, and, and it was just a bad mix, man. It was a really bad mix, and it was all in the name of selling tickets. Yeah, no kidding. I understand that completely. Now, when you talk about the Pistons, when we look back to now, we're going to have a chance to reminisce a little bit about 2004 because, you know, Chauncey was at the Palace yesterday versus uh, when the Pistons took on Denver. So now you look at this version, the 2016 version of the Pistons, and you go, man, they're looking a little bit like 
the 2004 team in terms of not having a quote-unquote superstar. They're trying to build a team. Andre Drummond can be that force on the inside. He's got young talent, and he could be a guy that can even be better than Ben Wallace. But a lot of people are still hesitant to say and pull the trigger that's, and to say that Reggie Jackson's Mr. Big Shot. Now, the last couple of games that the the Pistons had won, he was able to kind of elevate his game in the fourth quarter, but not against really great teams. You know, when the Pistons took on Toronto, again, a team that's playing out of this world, it's going to take a, a great effort. But the key difference that you see and the intangible that I'd like to see is play freaking defense. Why is it that all of a sudden the Pistons right now are giving up 100 points like it's going out of style? They're not play- it's It's tangible. You can see it. The Pistons on defense are struggling. And thank gosh we're now at the point where it's the all-star break because Dan Van Gundy can look at the film and go, the first 20 games on defense, you guys were, and that's a little bit about effort. It's about communication. What's going on where it's totally changed now this last stretch of games? I want this version to be a little bit like the 2004 team where they were nasty on defense and they were a team that, you know, was able to kind of effectively take out Kobe and Shaq in, a, in an NBA final series. If there was one thing I could pull from that 2004 Pistons team, more specifically from Chauncey Billups, it would be the leadership. And this is something that goes back to a couple of things that we've discussed this year. I think this team is talented. I think this team is really good. And I think they're on the verge of being one of the better teams in the league. When I say better, I mean one of those top five teams in the league. Because I think they have guys who can shoot. I think they have guys who can play defense. I think they have guys who can rebound. I think they have guys who can do everything that you need to do to win a championship. I think they're missing that leadership aspect, though. I think they're missing that person or that thing where... You know, you got to get to shoot around early. You got to stay a little bit late. You got to put a few extra hours in during the week to sit there and study some film. You got to do this. You have to do that. And all these little things end up making a monster difference come game 82 of the season when you're looking to go into game 83 of the season. And I think that's what they're missing right now. And I think that is just kind of the happenings of a young team. But you have a young team that has so much potential right now that if they could just master if somebody could come in and just show them how to be a leader and how to take over that role of this team we'd be talking about a much more consistent team we're talking about a team who as you said would play more defense would play better defense and you'd get victories over a team like a toronto uh, a team like a, a cleveland um a san antonio you'd be up in that upper echelon of the nba and i just think it's leadership right now that they're missing And I don't think that there's a guy on this roster besides possibly Brandon Jennings, but he's miscast in his role. He can't be the leader because he's coming off the bench. They don't have that right now. I think a guy like a Reggie Jackson or an Andre Drummond has to take that next step and has to become that leader. Exactly. And do you see this Pistons team still finishing out 500? Because right now, as we sit, you know, we're recording this before the Pistons play Denver. They could either be 27 and 27 or 28 and 26. So they're still right around 500, but... It just doesn't seem like a team that, without adding some pieces, is going to do a whole heck of a lot. Eighth seed now looks like it might be the ceiling. You know, the the NBA is so bad, especially the East, is so poor that I think that bodes well for this young Pistons team. I think they finished the season with 45 wins, so they're above 500. I think that I'm still going to hold true to my guns. I think they end up in sixth place, and I think this is a, a, a really good learning year for them. I don't know if they'll make any noise in the playoffs, but I think they'll get there, and I think that's good for this team. I think they need that. They have to build on that and move forward from it. I think next year and and a year from now, or two years from now, they'll be a much better team because that natural leader will have kind of surfaced, will have arisen, whether he's on that roster right now or they go out and they get him, whether it's through a draft or it's through a, a free agent pickup or it's through a trade. Somehow they'll get a leader in here, somebody who will help shape this team and help mold it into something that's more of a championship caliber team. Okay, no, I, I agree with you. I think they they need this All Star break at the. This is the right time for that. They got to go back and look at film. They got to get back and try to get healthy. I mean, KCP's injury came at the worst possible time. Absolute worst time. Falling on water. Come on, dude. Groin injury. Now there's a little bit of talk now that maybe uh, KCP might be a name that's thrown in there as a trade target. Maybe if, um, you know. Do you really want to trade him, though? No, he's got potential, but. He's, honestly, we used to kill that draft pick. We thought it was the dumbest thing ever. We were like, why not go get Trey Burke? Why not, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And now you look back at it, and you're like, well, maybe Joe D kind of knew what he was doing there. Because I think KCP is 
I think this team will be better with him than without him. So I don't think you trade him. I think you have to deal with his groin injury. Hopefully he can recover sooner than later from it. But I don't see him being traded. If you're going to trade anybody, it's going to be a guy like Brandon Jennings. Mm. He's your hot commodity to trade. So you show him a little bit more. You let him play maybe a two-guard spot, take over that role for KCP, let him bring up the ball a little bit, let him shoot the lights out because the guy's been playing really well coming off the bench. I think you sit there, you showcase his talents a little bit more. Maybe you can go out there and you can get something else that you need on this roster right now. Okay, so now let's turn our attention to the Red Wings, and you debuted a great podcast, very informative, a lot of great opinions regarding Steven Stamkos, one that's not exactly popular because a lot of people, when you look at it, want to bring him here because of his talent, but the way you you know worded it and phrased it regarding the salary cap ramifications, really well done, and to look at some other players that could help the Wings, it was really good. Go find it on our platform at Detroit Podcast, DetroitSportsPodcast.com, Jock's Red Wing Special, episode number one, so check it out, and very good stuff. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. The trade deadline's right around the corner, February 29th, and there's been a ton of moves in the NHL. With that being the case, what do you want to see the Red Wings go out and target as that trade deadline approaches? It's tough because my heart is, you know, pulling at two exactly opposite things. I need another scoring scoring forward, a guy that can be maybe put on that third or fourth line when it comes to the playoffs that you know is going to muck it up. A guy like a Thomas Holmstrom, a guy like a Franzen that you know when it comes down to the postseason, what are some key moments? The power play. And the power play, again, has been up and down. Now, when they score a couple goals, the power play is a little bit more effective. When they get in those droughts, that's when you see the power play get bogged down. They don't get enough shots on goal. So I want a guy that can have some presence, you know, maybe another power forward, a guy that can get in front of the net, cause some havoc, and also protect some of the guys, you know, because what are you seeing now? You're seeing guys, not overtly, but they're subtly, Checking Larkin a little bit here and there, trying to get him off the puck, trying to get him rattled off his game. And what do you think is going to happen in the postseason? Who's going to be target number one? It's going to be, I mean, goal 1A, 1B, 1C will be stop Larkin, injure Larkin, don't let Larkin beat us. That's going to be the, I mean, that's all you really got to do. And then uh, and then uh, D goal will be pray Howard gets in the net. <laughs> you, you know, because if he gets in the net, then you're guaranteed at least uh, an average uh, production a, a night of about three to four goals. So... You need a guy that's going to help protect. At the same time, you also need another defenseman. Because, you know, I do believe that as a hockey fan, I I like a team also that can, you know, skate freely through the zone, uh, cause a lot of havoc, create a lot of shots, but also can stop the uh, the opponent, can clear the puck and do the easy thing. So I'd like a nice power forward and I'd like a defenseman. Yeah, I think you're right on. What the Wings need to target is they need a forward and they need a defenseman. I don't know if they'll be able to go out and get the defenseman that they need or that they want because looking at the market right now, There's not a whole lot out there as far as defensemen who you can bring in and would make an immediate impact. Um, The guy that you really wanted was Dustin Bufflin. He just signed Mm -hmm. a five-year extension with the Winnipeg Jets. But that right there creates a situation in Winnipeg that the Wings may be able to capitalize on. There's a guy named Andrew Ladd. He's a stud. You were talking about that power forward. He's that guy. He is their captain in Winnipeg right now. He is going to be an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year. The guy doesn't score as much as he used to, but he's a big physical presence who can score. He has good hands, doesn't have the speed that he used to have, which wasn't a ton, but he's still quick enough. If you were to pair him with a guy like a Dylan Larkin, maybe even a Pavel Datsuk, somebody who can create and and make spectacular plays happen, he's a finisher. You go out, you get that guy, plus he works great on your power play. That would be a move that I would love the Wings to go out and make. Pick up a guy like an Andrew Ladd, uh, a, a big, nice, strong forward, who can sit there and, like you said, help you out on your power play. If you need to, he can help you out on your penalty kill. He can do all kinds of things. He's a very versatile player. On top of that, like I said, he's an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year. You can possibly sign him to something a little bit more long-term if you wanted to keep him and you've seen that he would fit in your rotation of what you want to try to do. And I don't think it'll cost you a ton because Winnipeg's going to probably lose him. So why not get him for something, maybe a prospect or two, um, and see what happens, you know. I would love them to go out and get another top four defenseman. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't see it working out that way. They might be able to add some depth on in, in the on the defense. I just don't think it's going to make that gigantic impact that you really want. And speaking of scoring, I know everybody wants Steven Stamkos. Everybody wants the Wings to get in on that sweepstakes for the Steven Stamkos. But I just don't see that happening anytime soon. I I, I don't think it would make financial sense for the Wings to go out there mortgage parts of their future to bring in Steven Stamkos, who in the long run, his cap hit's going to kill you. Honestly, it's going to murder you. 
he was talking about wanting an eight-year, $80 million deal. That's insane money. Like, you can't do that. The, the most expensive contract on the Red Wings right now is like $7.5 million. So why are you going to go out and pay somebody else two, two and a half more million dollars? It, it's just going to financially get you in, 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 in some constraints where you might not be able to get out of it later on. You're going to have to sit there and lose a few pieces if you're going to go out and sign this guy. And yes, I know he scores 20 to 30 goals every single season he's been in the league. I just don't think you want that mix on this lineup right now. I think sometimes he thinks he's a hot shot, and I think he, the way he acts, the way he sometimes carries himself, might not fit in with what the Wings want to do. How impressed were you with that performance, you know, in their last game? Mrazic played well. Um, again, I was like, you know, man, cuz, you know, I know you're watching this game and you're checking this out. Are they ever going to score? They're shooting like, like, they're shooting the lights out. They're doing a lot, but they didn't put the puck in the net until the third period, and then they got the offensive explosion. I think they were just waiting for my text to you. <laughs> That's probably what it was. But if you look at was it against the Panthers, it was against the Panthers who, who had success against them for uh, the better part of the season. That's right. On Thursday, uh, the Thursday before the that that game, um, they were manhandled six to three. So it just the Panthers are a very good team, probably the best team in the division right now. That being said, I think that the the Red Wings, if they're getting pucks to the net and they're sitting there and they're, they're chipping the puck in, they're chasing, retrieving it, and setting up in the zone. It's going to bode well for them eventually. And they kind of showed that in that game against the Panthers. They sat there. They got the puck in. They retrieved it, circled back. They set up, and they got shots to the net. And those shots to the net, eventually they're going to go in. You know, you can't score unless you shoot, right? And you got to put the puck on the net for it to go in. Eventually, there will be a crack in the wall, and it will slip in. So that's just what they have to do for right now. And mrazic has been impressive. I mean, when you Guy's see... He's a stud, man. It's like we're all waiting for the lineup to be announced to make sure that Jimmy Howard's not in there because Mrazic is, gives you a, a, a really great chance. So let's just knock on wood that he stays, stays, uh, stays very healthy. Doc and Jock are praying ever so hard to make sure that Peter Mrazic stays, in, stays healthy and Dylan Larkin stays healthy and that this team is able to continue to um, uh, play at this, at this good level because, man... It's tight because you see it's tight. Every every effort to make two points is uh, each and each and every night to get those points is tough. And with each win, the the order in the line, the order in the standings is just shifting so wildly. Yeah, you're right on. I mean, there's such a congestion right now for that second place spot in the Atlantic Division mm-hmm. that either a win or a loss is going to propel you forward a whole bunch of spots, or it's going to propel you back a whole bunch of spots. So they need to win every game possible right now. It's that time of year. It's a stretch. So are you buying or selling on these Detroit Red Wings in the second half of the year? I'm buying on them. You, you have to. The strides that Dylan Larkin has made, I think they're figuring some things out with their lineup. You've got Hendrik Zetterberg and you got Pavel Detsuk playing on a line together, and that's result, resulting in goals. Um, I, I like what's going on with their third and their fourth lines. You know, they might not be contributing a lot on the scoreboards, but they're doing little things out there that are important. Um, I see the Wings going out and being buyers at the trade deadline, possibly this might hurt some of your feelings, but possibly giving up on a guy like a, a um, an Anthony Mantha to get a bigger name in here to help contribute right now. Mm. So just be on the lookout for that, okay? Okay, I'll be on the lookout. And, uh, yeah, this is a big season for the Red Wings. I mean, you can't miss the playoffs with the talent that you've assembled. This is a team that can get hot, and if with the right moves, with the right combination and playing a little bit better, yeah, we see some success with this team. And Peter Mrazek is is now coming into his own. He's he's he sh- It looks like he's able to shoulder the burden, is able to go out there and play consistently night in, night out, and he makes some big saves, dude. He just is a guy that you want to watch, and when you watch the Red Wings, you go, okay, Peter Mrazek is going to do something tonight, and it's a fun watch. Exactly. You're right on, dude. And I think Peter Mrazek is key. Getting him situated as the number one goaltender going forward, I think that's key. When you sit there and you're playing goaltender roulette and you're not really sure who your number one guy is, it makes it a little bit difficult in that locker room to know who you can count on behind you and what you can kind of do. I mean, honestly, knowing who your number one goaltender is really affects the way that you play in front of him. So now that they know that Mrazek's their guy, they can sit there and they can adjust accordingly. You're going to see Howard play a couple games. He has to. He's got to give Mrazek a breather now and again. So just be leery of that. And this team, I think, will move forward, and I think it's going to be good. I, I'm really gearing up for this stretch run here. I think the wings are going to be solid. All, All that being said, it's time for the coronation. It's time for the coronation. Yes, sir. Clap for me. Thank you. There, there. Is that no, better? No, no. Two-time. 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 NFL Pick'em Champion Doc. Let me just recap. 
what happened. Let me get my thank yous out of the way. I'd like to thank myself. I'd like to thank my IE Explorer for all the research that I did. I'd like to thank, you know, the podcast studio for a, for allowing me to turn the mics on, get all hot, and be able to express what's going on and uh, talk to you guys about the NFL picks each and every week. Now, I was, you know, in a situation where I was down early. I didn't get rattled. I wasn't flustered. I was able to, you know, withstand the pressure and the heat a little bit when Jock took the, the lead midway through the season. Then I, I rallied and held on and performed at the, at the perfect time, which is crunch time, baby, and that's when I came through. And then we changed up the routine a little bit. I made the first pick in the Super Bowl, and I had to, you know, basically it was win or go home. And the popular pick would have, said, would have been take Carolina, like all the pundits said, like everybody uh, on the Motor City Sports Rant said. Everybody was like, when I said, hey, take Denver in the points, was looking at me like all cross-eyed. Like, Cam Newton's going to go out there and dominate. It's Cam Newton. It's Carolina. They're going to go out there. They're going to dominate. They're going to go out there and crush. And I'm like, you're not going to even entertain the thought that Cam Newton's the first time, you know, his first appearance in the Super Bowl. You're not going to entertain that thought. You're not going to entertain that Denver is a superb defense. You're not even going to entertain the fact that they might play 15% better to get their quarterback out with the victory. You're not going to entertain all that. You're just going to say Carolina's great because you're into the flash. You're into the pizzazz. But with age comes knowledge. With age comes whispers. With age comes experience and say, hey, now, slow down. Slow your roll, Vinny Stubbs. Slow your roll. Let's make a bet. Get me a sandwich if, if Denver covers the points. Thank you, Vinny, for that sandwich. It was very delicious. <laughs> I hope you didn't add any special sauce because I asked for mayonnaise. And he kept asking me, he kept, <laughs> he kept asking me, how's that sandwich taste? How's that sandwich taste? I'm like, what'd you put in it? <laughs> He's like, that mayo is extra tangy. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> you should have tasted like this victory. <laughs> I, was, and I scarfed it down, dude. So if he put something in it, whatever. Oh. Me, me, and Vinny will be a little, me and Vinny will be a little bit closer. Yeah, you will. But I won the picks. You I won 53 it. to 44. In the end, it wasn't even close. It was a rout. Because I, I came through at the right times, and I picked Denver to win the Super Bowl. And... You know, we're all happy here at the network for Kenny. He's a Denver slappy, and he picked a B team, and, B, and Denver's his B team, and la di da di da but good for him. But they got me the title. I'm the two-time champion. I'll go into this offseason um, with full confidence that I should be able to continue to have success. I'd like to thank me, myself, and um, basically myself and my brain, <laughs> and um, thanks everyone out there for listening. Once we uh, stop with the podcast, we'll raise the banner up on the wall there, and um, you'll have two to my one. So it'll be 20, uh, 2013 Adam, 2014, 2015 Doc. That's right. Two victories to one, and it was a fun time. Now we have to kind of have a little lull period where we kind of look at the Tigers and kind of look at the Lions and rebuilding and maybe wait for this Calvin News. So it's going to be a little bit slow time, but we're um, definitely going to bring it strong each and every week, and definitely news is made. I always find it that there's so much to talk about in sports. We could just sit down and just say, hey, what do you think about the Tigers this week? And we just start, start ranting and raving. Next so thing fun. you know, an hour and a half goes by, and Next we're like, oh, wow, we got to cut a bunch of this. No, this is good. It's good stuff. I love doing this podcast. Our network is strong, and uh, all the shows coming up are great. The one-on-ones, like I said, are, are picking up, and we're happy with everything. And uh, no, that was cool that you said that you know you like the studio set up here, and uh, you know seeing a different studio set up, kind of get the, uh, the flair of what others are doing. And uh, Podcast Detroit's doing great. You know, Cave Radio's doing good. The other networks out there that are coming or out are really performing each and every week. So this whole podcast thing is, is picking up. So you got a chance in the position for podcasts because a lot of people are doing it and uh, in the world of Detroit sports you know there's a lot of things you can talk about so I love this whole podcasting thing I love our network so check us out DetroitSportsPodcast.com and support our sponsors definitely Fanatic U Detroit Beard Collective Team Top Cat Sales all our great sponsors are great man so everything's going good no complaints everything is great man I love this DSPN Detroit Sports Podcast Network DSPN Thank you to Theo Gridiron for having us on his podcast. It was a fun experience recapping the Super Bowl and uh, talking about some great, uh, you know, so talking about Calvin Johnson as well. For the Jock Adam Strozinski, I am the Doc John Macaroon signing off. We'll see everybody next Thursday. You know that. Go Wings, go Stones. Sorry, Detroit. <laughs> it didn't quite work out. And I, all I can say is Detroit Sports Podcast scores. I have voices in my head. They count to me. They understand. They talk to me.